And so if you get your outlines out with me this morning, this Sunday is called Palm Sunday, and it describes for us uh, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, and it is very significant. All um, of the Gospels uh, tell the story of the triumphal entry, and there's a reason for that because it is very important because of how it is a fulfillment of prophecy. If you uh, look at the screen here, I'm going to read uh, Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11, and it says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to uh, Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and sat him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude says, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth from Galilee. And so as we see in this text, Jesus is being presented here uh, as the king of Israel. And it begins by showing some of the preparation that is taking place for the triumphal entry here. If you look on your outline, look with me with uh, verse 2. Jesus uh, saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. Now, if Jesus said that to me, I'd probably say, Jesus, we can't do that. That's called stealing. You know, it's like Jesus said, hey, go hotwire that car for me. No, he's not saying that. What is taking place here is either this happened supernaturally or Jesus made a provision before that. Maybe he met somebody and somebody said, hey, if you have anything uh, that I have or need of me or, or any of my possessions, uh, consider them yours. And so we see here that nonetheless, uh, they wrote about this because it, it is very uh, important. So look at with me verse 5 and 6. He says, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse 6, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. Now the reason why this text is so important is because it is a fulfillment of prophecy about the coming Messiah, that there are over 300 prophecies that is fulfilled in a life and a death and a resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so this is one of the fulfillments that we see here in the triumphal entry uh, is mentioned again in all four of the Gospels. And so it's important because it's a fulfillment, if you get this, of the messianic prophecy about the Messiah, and that is important because this is what gets Jesus crucified with the religious leaders. Now look on your outline to Zechariah uh, chapter 9, verse 9, and he says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold your king, say king, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So here's what's interesting. We see the same verbiage here in Zechariah 9, 9, 9 as we see it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What's interesting about this text is in Zechariah 9, 9, it was written 500 years before this took place. And so we see how interesting enough that in Jesus' life, 
there is these messianic uh, verses that is fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And so that's important. Another interesting fact is during time of war, a king would always be riding a horse. And in time of peace, the king would ride on a donkey. So here we see Jesus, the donkey, and a, a, a foal. And so it symbolizes that King Jesus came in peace, and he also came in humility. Look at me here in verse 9. It says this, Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna. Say Hosanna with me. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So here in the story, they bring the donkey. They laid their clothes on the donkey and set Jesus on it. And as Jesus is headed on the road to Jerusalem, multitudes begin to spread their garments on the road. Others cut branches, palm branches is where we get Palm Sunday from. And they uh, probably put that down to soften the ride as a king, as it was symbolic of royalty. And um, this was probably, if you think about it, probably an exciting time for the disciples. They probably thought that this is a recognition that Jesus deserves. And they're probably thinking they're potentially leading in the chosen one, the Messiah, the anointed one. And the whole city we see is shaken by this entry. We see Jesus here as the king. The king that comes in peace and humility. The king is acclaimed by his people and the king is crowned with praise. But the people were blind to Jesus' pur purpose. It was prophesied that the king or the Messiah would bring peace, but these people were looking for a political peace, for a temporal peace. It's like what was taking place, they were being oppressed by the Roman government. And so they were looking for Jesus to, to give them uh, a peace, to, to be saved, if you will, by the tyranny of the Roman government. Even Today, how many of you know that, that there is a lot of politics going on in our day and age? And a lot of people are looking for a certain leader to deliver them or to save them from the tyranny that is going on today. It's very similar. Uh, it was a little bit worse, I'm sure, then, but who knows how worse it's going to get, right? And so we know it's going to get worse. And so uh, I, I want to say this to you, don't be focused on some political leader to save you, uh, because the systems of this world will eventually collapse, but the kingdom of Jesus Christ will go on forever and ever and ever, so we need to focus upon the kingdom of the Lord. So don't get caught up in the politics of our day and age, are you with me? Uh, if some of you all, as much as you watch TV, would read God's word, we'd be living in a different place, I think. But anyway, turn off the news and pick up the good news. You can get bad news on TV any day. Anyway. And so they were looking for a political peace instead of a spiritual peace, instead of an, an eternal uh, peace, if you will. Now, if you look um, here, they were saying Hosanna. Now, uh, I asked several people this week, what does Hosanna mean? And they all said the same thing. It means praise. And we use Hosanna as a praise word, don't we? As we praise Hosanna in the highest. But the word Hosanna in the Greek basically means save, please. Save us, please. If you're looking at Aramaic or if you look in Hebrew, it would be the word save now. You could probably come to the conclusion they're probably crying out, save us now, please. <laughs> Something like that, as we see in the text. So the word Hosanna, when Jesus is there, they're crying out, save us. Save us. And we can see here, uh, I'm going to read the same verse that is found in the book of John, in John 12, 12 and 13, just to uh, show you the difference here. It says, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, the Passover feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. So again, this is a messianic prophecy given for the Messiah. Now go with me to Psalms, uh, chapter 118, verses 25 and 26. Here's the word for Hosanna. Say it with me. Save now. I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That word for prosperity is the word for success. So save now, I pray, O Lord. Save, O now, I pray. Uh, be successful in saving us. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the Lord did save us. Amen. And again, most of the people were looking for the wrong thing because just a few days later, those who were saying, Hosanna, save us, are yelling, crucify him. And so it is a powerful thing, as we talked about last week, the, the significance of all that this means, and it shows uh, to us the importance of these prophecies that are being fulfilled. Now, this prophecy in Psalm 118 was about a thousand years before Christ. Isn't that amazing? So the first prophecy we saw was 500 years. This is a thousand years before Christ, and it was again fulfilled in the life of Christ, that he is the anointed one, that he is the Messiah and the King. So again, this shows that Jesus was presented as the Messiah, the King of Kings, the anointed one. And you can imagine this ticked off the religious leaders, if you will, because they knew that these verses were about the Messiah and that the people were claiming Jesus as the King of Kings, the Messiah, and the anointed one. And that's what basically got Jesus crucified in humanistic terms, if you will. And so we see this, that um, Jesus, you can write this down, Jesus is our king. So in this text, we see three things uh, about Jesus. The first one, that, that Jesus is our king. It shows that through the scriptures. It throws it through a fulfillment of prophecy, and it shows us through the text here. And then look with me at verse 11. So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So we see here that the people identified him as a prophet. Those in the Old Testament uh, who were prophets spoke the heart and the mind of God. And now look at the next verse in Acts 3.22. It says this, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, say prophet, like me from your brethren, him, notice it's capitalized, you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. So this is a reference and a prophecy that we see that Moses is saying about the Messiah. And so we see here he'll be a prophet like me. Again, speaking the heart and the mind of God. So this text is important because it alludes to the fact that God used Moses who spoke the heart of God to the people to establish the old covenant that they were delivered from bondage and slavery from Egypt because Egypt was synonymous with bondage and slavery. And so there was that covenant we talked about last week, that sacrificial substitute covenant. Because when sin entered the world, there was a separation, right? Because of sin, there was a separation from a holy, righteous God to sinful humanity. And so God could not have relationship with man. So he inst instituted this sub um, substitutionary, <laughs> say that fast three times, substitutionary. This is only my second service. Anyway, it's a substitutionary um, sacrifice that would take place in the Old Testament. And so in order to have a, a covenant, uh, you needed a covenant to be a blessing. So for God, 
to bless the people, he had to have a covenant, and he had this temporal plan in order that he can have relationship with the people. Are you with me? And so it was this substitutionary where he took an animal, and the sins would be put on this animal. So in Malachi's day, they had a table, and that table represents where they would sacrifice the animal. So on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would sacrifice for his own sins because he was getting ready to go into the Holy of Holy Place to present the Day of Atonement, the sacrifice for the nation. So he sacrificed the bull for his sins to make sure he was right when he went into the Holy of Holy. They would have two male goats. One would be a, a goat for sacrifice for perfect purification, and the other one was a scapegoat where the sins would be laid on a scapegoat, they would take the goat out of the nation as symbolic that the sins of the nation was coming off of them. And so it was that substitutionary sacrifice that was instituted so God could have a relationship with man. Are you with me? <laughs> okay. And then we see Jesus come in the new covenant. He establishes it where people would not only experience salvation, but they would experience the very presence of God. Now look at Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. So again, the law is perfect in every way. No one is perfect. In other words, no, none of us in humanity can fulfill the perfection of the law, right? Because we all fail next to perfection. But Jesus came to fulfill all the law. Why? Because he was perfect in every way. He is a fulfillment of the law. He is also a fulfillment of the prophets who spoke the heart and the mind of God. He is God himself who spoke the heart and mind. So there was a fulfillment in Jesus. So write this down. Number two, Jesus is identified as our prophet. Jesus is our king. Jesus is our, our uh, prophet who came to fulfill all the perfection of the law because of his holiness and righteousness. Then look with me to Matthew 21, 12 through 17. And he says this, Then Jesus went into the temple of God, and he drove out all those who brought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to him, yes, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Then he left them and he went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. It is interesting that Jesus went into the temple to clean it out. People were putting money before they were putting God. They were putting selfishness before God. And so we see here in the text that Jesus drove out the money changers, and then what did he do? He healed the lame and he healed the blind, proving that he was who he said he was. And instead of being glad, how many of you be glad if you saw a blind person be able to see or a lame person be able to walk? But they became indignant. Why? Because they were religious. Their hearts were far from God. And so we see that they were indignant because Jesus was healing people, because Jesus was uh, who he said he was, that he, when you see me, you see the Father, and he was claiming to be the Messiah, but his own people rejected him. And so we see that sometimes the Lord has to come in 
and clean our house. Boy, they, they fought the Lord. How many of you have ever fought the Lord when he tried to come in and clean your house? Tried to turn over the money changers, turn over the tables and the chairs? Come on. Yeah. And so we need to make sure that the Lord, that we allow him to clean our hearts, our temple. So write this down. Not only is Jesus our king, not only is the prophet, Jesus is our priest. He is our priest. It says this in Hebrews 2, 17. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. It would be the word for humankind. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That word propitiation is a fancy word for atonement. Um, so again, Jesus is not only our king, our prophet, our priest. He is actually our sacrifice as well. And so what's interesting to note is a similarity that we see between the prophet Moses and Jesus is the fact that Moses was a deliverer of the Old Testament to deliver the people out of sin and bondage. And so when I say sin city, what city do you think of? The Raiders, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, sorry. Las Vegas, okay. I didn't mean to insult all of you Raiders fans in one swoop, but I did a pretty good job. But anyway, so if you were to say Egypt at the same time, it would have the same connotation because it was very symbolic of sin and bondage and slavery. And God sent a deliverer there. And one of the plagues was that of Passover, where God told Moses to tell the people to take a lamb with no spot, spot or blemish and to take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorpost of the household. And the death angel would come and pass over the house. They celebrate it even to this day. And so what's ironic is during this time, we know through the scriptures, that with, this was during Passover. And so during Passover, they would get the Passover lambs. And that's why Jesus was so upset. This is why Jesus was so angered, because he was trying to prepare them for the true sacrifice and yet it was these in the temple that they mocked God by trying to make money off of him. And here Jesus goes and he cleanses the temple. So in the same way we see that a Passover lamb was taken and it was taken and set aside and, and it was inspected. And we see kind of similar if you really dive into the text how Jesus was taken away <laughs> and Jesus was examined and he was found to have no fault. That's why we see someone not wanting to be faultless was washing his hands. <laughs> why? Because they found no fault in Jesus. And so we see here that the substitutionary sacrifice that was done for all these years was now going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. I want us to see a short little video here and then we're going to come to the table again to receive communion. Again, what Paul the Apostle was pointing out is they were complaining about the table, but he says what you don't understand is you're complaining about the table when you should be excited about the table. Because it's at that table where sin and death is taken care of. And so often we take for granted the meaning of the table. 
we know that in Malachi, he's talking about the table where they sacrifice. And here we see Jesus at the table. Jesus is at the table, and he's describing the things that I said about the sacrifice that would take place. Let's watch this video, and then we're going to receive communion together. Worship team, would you come forward?